Hi, and welcome back to Biblical Theology, Exegesis, and Hermeneutics, where meaning is always context-driven. I'm your host, John Strazic, and today we'll be continuing on uh, on our second part of the series here um, on the firmament in Genesis 1-6, to um, and we will be looking at some of the ancient uh, Jewish commentators and some lexicons and some modern commentators um, and I think we're going to have to hang it up there for a third part. Um, but anyhow, so this should just bring, this should be wrapping up everything that we said last week and, and basically confirming it by, by, by showing you how, um, ancient and modern commentators and, and lexicons, um, have defined rakia, um, and, um, and some related terms that would be synonyms. Um, so uh, if you have your Bibles, um, go ahead and open them up to Job chapter 37. Okay, and coming here to, um, to this particular slide, um, what we're looking at here is an ancient Egyptian brass mirror. Um, and what happened in the ancient world, these were polished, uh, you know, highly polished, and you would be able to see your reflection in this. These, these, this was an ancient mirror, um, and, and we can see this actually being spoken about here um, by Elihu in the Book of Job, um, and I believe this here is the the ESV here. Can you, like him, spread out the skies hard as a cast metal mirror? So you would understand that today nobody in in the current you know in our current uh uh you know times here uh would ever refer to you know the skies as something that was hard as you know um you know brass okay it's cast a casted metal mirror no one would ever you know refer to the skies as, as something like that but they actually did in the ancient world here um, and if we look down here at the Hebrew text, we have Tarkia, Imo, Lishchakim. So this is actually um, the verb of Rakia. This is Raka here, okay, um, in the Tifil form here, um, Tarkia. And, and so literally, um, you know, so, so Eli, who's, you know, giving, asking Job some rhetorical questions. So he's saying here, have you, um, hammered out with him the skies? Um, hard. And then this Kiri is, is as a mirror, Mutsak, which has been casted. So it's, it's a, it, as a molten, you know, uh, mirror, you know, um, so to read this all together, um, have, have you hammered out with him the skies hard as a molten mirror? Um, and, and this would, uh, this would be a very good translation for this. And, uh, and this is, you know, to give you an idea that this is what, you know, is in the mind of Elihu, uh, as he's speaking with Job here. Um, and interrogating him, um, and, uh, and and so this is just uh, you know j this this is a part of the biblical record, uh, and this is a very very important testimony here coming from the scripture itself, um, and uh, and so uh, you should know about this. Now, one thing we should say that. Um, you know, why did all the ancient, uh, you know, societies, you know, have a flood story? You know, in order to have a flood story, you have to have a firmament. Now, you got to put on your thinking cap for this. It's impossible to have a universal flood story if you don't have a firmament, because the purpose of the firmament, as we've already seen in you know, even in the Enuma Elish, uh, is that it's holding back the the heavenly waters, okay? And and they were, you know, the in the Enuma Elish, they were terrified of the heavenly waters of Tiamat, um, you know, the you know in Babylonia, um, you know, with this whole celebration of Marduk, you know, because he made sure that you know he he slayed her body and with the upper. You know, with one 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 fillet of her body of this dragoness, 
he made the the firmament okay all right and then f with the other half he he made the earth and he said that he he made sure that he bolted it up so that the waters would not be released this chaos so the you know this 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 was repeated by you know by you know Noah and his three sons to everyone that followed because they became you know the the Adam and Eve of their generation because they were the only the eight souls that were that survived the flood um, and so all the flood stories come to us from from Shem Ham and Japheth and, and Noah um, and so the firmament they knew that the waters uh, you know that God opened up the waters um, uh, of the firmament. Um, and, and, the, and the springs of the great deep and that that's what flooded the earth because you can't flood the earth with just normal atmospheric conditions you guys that that can't happen if you just take all the you know all the precipitation and moisture in the air and wring it out upon the earth you're never going to flood the earth especially with 15 cubits above every mountain Okay, like the biblical text says. So he, in order to flood the earth, you got to have water from an outside source. Okay, um, and there's never going to be enough water in some canopy theory where where you can actually flood the earth by 15 cubits. I mean that's ridiculous. I mean you know I um, mean you know, that that you know that that was a half baked thought. You know a half baked theology. You know you can't. There's it's, it's impossible. I mean. You know, I mean, even, you know, just thinking, you know, you can't even flood. The, if you took all the water out of the Pacific Ocean and threw it up on the United States, it would all just flow right straight back into the Pacific Basin where it all came from. So it's impossible to have a universal flood uh, uh, of any measure without, you, you know, obtaining waters from an outside source. So that's why the waters of day one were cut in half by the firmament and they were up above the firmament and the sun, moon, and stars were put inside of the firmament. Okay. So there was a, there's a bunch of heavenly waters enough that, that God could let through the sluices of the, uh, you know the windows of the firmament to, to then flood the earth and then to bring up some from beneath um, and then all of that that moisture that we saw that you know would come up from the ground um, and you know the the mist that would come up from the ground all of that moisture that was in the air that was creating what you would refer to as your canopy theory you know those people that hold to that um, well, that that canopy theory stuff is just the moisture that was coming up from the ground, according to Genesis two, um, and and then all that would have rained for forty days and forty nights, and you know, so through these three different sources, uh, the mist, uh, and then the heavenly oceans, and then the 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 springs of the deep opened up, and that's how the earth was flooded. Um, and but 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 you have to have a firmament in order to have a universal flood and and then the ocean waters the heavenly waters were above and that is why all ancient societies have um a firmament um and that the, and that is especially in the Babylonian creation story the firmament was created uh before the sun moon and stars cuz you have to have a, a, a house or a tent in which to put you know the 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 sun and the moon and then all the the stars they have to be placed somewhere and so they're placed within inside of the firmament um and, and that is what we observe today okay then coming here um this is the next uh scripture here in proverbs um here in 8 27 and 28 here um and, and so up here you have the esv translation for you and and, and looking down here at, at verse 27 here um we'll we'll look here uh when he established the heavens i was there when he inscribed a circle a hook uh, upon the face of the deep uh when he made hard the she the the shehakim uh the skies above um and when he made uh firm the springs of the deep 
So here, um, you know, he's he, he's uh, he's talking. Um, you know, this is wisdom. This is Hokma here, Lady Wisdom here speaking. Um, you know, since Hokma is a, a feminine noun here, then uh, it's that's why we would say something like this. But anyhow, um, so it's just wisdom speaking, and um, and and she says here. Um, you know that you know when 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 uh, when when God here established the heavens, you know she was there, and and when He inscribed a circle on the face of the deep, um, and, and we'll get back to this here, this encircling a circle upon the face of the deep. This is talking about the world oceans, and, and then inside of it are all the different continents here. Uh, but so the the continents of the world are surrounded by an ocean that Yahweh inscribed as a circle and we'll get to we'll get to that later um, maybe uh, on on the next video when we treat uh, day three um, because that's that that's when this will actually come into play here um, but anyhow then in 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 in, uh, in verse 28 here it says uh, when he made firm or he made hard the Shechakim here, the skies above. Uh, when he made strong the the um, you know the springs of the deep. So you can see here that uh, what he's done here in line twenty seven. He talks about um, uh, he talks about the the heavenly realm here. When he established the heavens, I was there. And then on the second verse set. Then he's talking about uh, down upon the the earth level when he inscribed a circle on the face of the deep. So this he's you know twenty seven. He's talking about heaven, the heavenly area. Line B, the the earthly area. So he does the same again. When he made strong the skies above, this is the heavenly area. Okay, and when he made firm the springs of the deep. When he made strong the springs of the deep, so he's uh, the, the the you know the synonymous parallelism here is um, you know is you know in this quatrain here you can you can see how he's developing his thoughts uh, between the heaven the heavenly realms and the and the and the earthly realms, um, but anyhow the the important point here that I wanted to establish is that here it's talking about. The heavens as if they were hard um, and solid and firm um, and so this is uh, this just you know this is not how we speak in normal language okay and then coming here then to this particular slide um, this is uh, Josephus and um, in the antiquities of the Jews um, book one in chapter one um, which, if you type that into the internet, you can you know you can see the works of Flavius Josephus. They're they're all over the internet, um, and and uh, and right there it would be on the very first page. Uh, he begins to he starts the antiquities of the Jews off with commenting on Genesis. So actually, this would you, know, you could look at this as an early uh, uh, commentary on uh, on. Uh, on Genesis one, because uh, he he begins here talking about the first day, um, and then here in, uh, in in line thirty it says, and after this, it says on the second of the days, um, he placed um, heaven um, over the whole. When he separated it, and that just and this is means heaven. When he separated it from the other things, meaning the earth, um, he deemed um, he deemed to set it apart by itself, um, both having pitched up crystal about it. That means means heaven. Um, and artistically design har it harmonious to the earth, and uh, I, I guess and, and with moisture and uh, with rains, um, and for the advantage of dews. Um, 
and this is what he says here. Um, and, and so Josephus, uh, remember, he is at the he's in the first century, um, and, and he is somebody actually that would be giving a pretty much a regnant view uh, of the the Jewish perspective. Um, uh, of of uh, a description of what's happening on the second day, so you can see here that he's looking here at the you know that that the firmament is definitely crystalline, um, and uh, um, and that he's on the second day. He's uh, that he 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 deemed that the heaven should be separated from the earth, and that he pitched up around it. Um, uh, are, are built, or you could say, built up around it here uh, with crystal, um, and then uh, having artistically, you know, joined it to the earth um, for, uh, I, I guess we would say, for uh, you know, moisture and rain, and for the advantage here uh, of dews. Um, so this is the testimony of Josephus, um, and uh, this this comes, you know, in late first century, uh, just after Christ. Um, but this was definitely the, you know, he, he would have represented the the uh, the, you know, the 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 regnant voice of, of Judaism at this particular time. So this is a very excellent. Um, uh, early commentary or, or comments, uh, uh, you know, upon Genesis one, and he, and, you know, his crystalline thing here, he obviously would have taken, a, as we were suggesting in in our last, uh, um, in our in our last presentation here, that that you know, he's where does he where does he get you know crystalos here, you know, well he gets it straight out of Ezekiel from Karak. You know, um, and uh, or you know, or from reading the Septuagint on the same passage in Ezekiel one, so this is very, very, very important, um, and um, and you you need to be aware of this, and uh, um, and 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 there's nothing here. He's in agreement with you'll see with everybody else. Okay, and then coming here, um, we're looking at Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer um, in chapter three. This is a a Jewish work um, uh, from the, I believe, from the Mishnaic period, um, and it, it, there there seems to be some type of updating. So say scholars uh, are, uh, around 900 um, A.D. Uh, but this goes back to the Mishnaic area uh, time. Um, and and this is really cool um, because this this uh, um, joins um, Amos um, chapter nine verse six, and it joins uh, Psalm one o four here. Um, and I don't know; it might be around three something, but. Um, this 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 is one of the the most important uh, um, texts that we can find because it, it comments on Amos chapter nine verse six, which is uh, it's a singular voice from the Old Testament um, con concerning the the firmament, um, and 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 so we'll we'll read here this first line here, uh, and it, and it says Kur Kose Hashemayim. Bememe Oki Yanos Haim Ahosim. Um so what this says here, this this particular word here derives from the biblical word keres, okay? Um which just simply means clasp, okay? Um and um and, and this specifically um goes back to Exodus um you know chapters um uh you know um 25 to to 40 where they have the the call for the you know for a contribution for the you know for, you know for taking up a contribution to build the tabernacle um and then there's the 
the rebellion that takes place, you know, um, at Mount Sinai when when Aaron, you know, builds, uh, you know, this this golden calf incident in chapters uh, thirty two and thirty three, um, I believe somewhere right around there. Um, but but I know from chapters thirty five forward, it's it's the you know then it's the execution of building the tabernacle and they raise it up on New Year's Day. Um, um, on the second year after coming out of the land of you know Egypt, um, but but keras here um, the, or you know this term here, kurkose here, um, this is the word clasp and it's referring to the remember that the 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 the, the tabernacle uh, when it was made in the edges of the of of the of each curtain they were to make these these 50 little loops um you know in the edge and then they were to be attached to the next um you know there there was the, the other you know then then uh curtain and then they were to be attached by some type of clasp and they were to be you know so there's these 50 of these clasps that are joining the curtains together okay so so listen to this line Kurkose uh, Hashemayim Bimeme Okiyanos Haim Ahosim. The clasps of heaven, they took hold on the waters of the ocean. And so this is going to get really cool. Whose waters the ocean stood between the ends of the heaven and between the ends of the earth. And, uh, and and then the ends of the heaven, they took hold upon the waters of the ocean, whose waters of the ocean were uh, between the ends of the earth and, uh, and, and between the ends of the heaven. Um, and the ends of the heaven, they were spread out over the waters of the ocean, uh, which is which it is said, uh, the one who lays beams in the waters of his upper chambers okay so what's going on here if you know the clasps of heaven you know they take hold on the waters of the earth okay you got to remember when there's many times in in the in the um in the old testament he says he spreads out the heavens uh, like a curtain, okay, which that will say this, like if you go to Psalm 104, go there, um, and it'll say he stretches out heavens like a curtain, and it even will say this again in like Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22, where it says, you know, he who sits above the circle of the earth, uh, and he, when he looks down, he sees the inhabitants like grasshoppers, and he's, the, you know, he says, the one who spreads out the heavens uh, like a, a a a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. And so there's a numbers of times where you know many many times where where it's he says he spreads out the heavens like um, a uh, like a curtain. All right. So so what he's referring here to is that it's it's the, it's the you know he's talking about. The, the you know the metaphor of a tent that that the heavens are the metaphor of a tent so the it be, this now this is what it is the the clasps of heaven they take hold on the waters of the earth this he's talking about the the dome he's talking about the the um the firmament okay because in amos chapter 9 it says here um Haboni, I just you know, uh, I, I'll, I'll just read this. The one who builds uh, his upper chambers in the heavens, he founded it, in, in that is his um, agudato, his his his. Um, uh, we're gonna we're gonna say uh, his vault. He founded it. He founded his vault upon the earth. Uh, the one who lays beams in the waters of uh, the sea, um, who pours 
uh, them out upon the face of the earth. Yahweh is his name. So Amos 9, 6 is also referring to the, you know, something that's going on here in, in Psalm 104, as well as Psalm 19, you know, Yahweh says that he, you know, he, uh, he pitched a tent for the sun. So, you know, and he's talking about, you know, the, you know, uh, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows the works of His hands. So that that there, um, the tent, David's metaphorical tent, is the firmament. Okay, and so um, you know, in in this Perke de Rabbi Eliezer, he's he's talking now. He's he, this guy is really smart because now he says the clasps of heaven. So. Um, they take hold on the waters of the earth. So, so the 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 uh, the heavens are going to join the earth to complete the the, the tent. Okay, um, and so <laughs> so this is what he does, and he he you know he waxes eloquent here and shows his you know. Um, I, I guess he struts his stuff that, that he knows. It's really cool. Um, but, but this is a testimony, um, of the, that, that, the, the, the firmament, it, it, he's saying that because it's like, it's, you know, that he spreads out the, the heavens like, uh, like a curtain. Well, now he, he's putting, uh, clasps in the edge of this curtain and it's being attached now to the waters of the sea. Or you know, down, basically down to the earth, but it's to the waters of the sea, um, and um, and so this is what this whole metaphor is about. And then he he quotes down here, um, you know, there there's several of these passages. One is in Amos nine six, uh, and the other is more you know is probably a little more famous here in Psalm uh, 104, right around 3. But the the clasp of heaven being attached to the waters of the sea, well, that's going to come right out of Amos 9. So it's telling us then that the firmament actually comes down and, and is attached to the earth. And, and this, is real, this is a singular voice of the Old Testament telling us this. Um, and um, so this is important then um, for for all of these drawings, then that we see that you know how the ancient Hebrews you know understood um, the the earth to look like. Um, it, it also it, it it involves Amos nine, and it involves here you know the, this uh, this statement here by Rabbi Eliezer, um, and um, so this is very important, um, and you should probably. Um, make note of this uh this is this is really excellent so so this is a, this also is a commentary here um uh the old testament's uh, upon the old testament uh by uh, uh a rabbi here during the mishnaic period um and uh and this is very very important and this uh okianos here um yeah, um, okay, on Nas, excuse me. I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm doing it here. Um, this would be written like this. Here, Th this, this is not a Hebrew word here. Okianos. This is just simply a transliteration here of Okianos here, um, which is Greek, and this is the word ocean, and we get, um ocean basically this is an e here o c e a n here ocean we get we 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 derive our word ocean right from here okianos um and uh we just end it here at the new but to to english readers it looks like a v but it's a, it's an n sound ocean so this is uh where we get the word ocean from here um and they transliterated this into into Hebrew um okeyanos here okay um that's just a little bit of uh, uh of history here and um so this second testimony uh, of i guess er, you know early commentary Jewish commentary on the bible uh, it's affirming the 
the the the firmament and how it's attached to the earth and and and, and using the word clasps from the uh you know uh dire directly from from the the you know the uh the the passage in 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 Exodus about the tabernacle and and, and so basically what we would you know what we could further say here is that the I guess that the the firmament basically is kind of like the parochet. Um, you know, it's the veil that separates the holy place from the holy of holies, um, and uh, and you could apply that easily to um, the the firmament that was seen above the heads of the uh, of the cherubim there in Ezekiel, um, and, and because God sits uh, above, just like Isaiah, you know. He, his, you know, God's throne is in heaven, his, his footstools upon the earth. Okay, now coming here then to uh, Wilhelm Gesenius, um, for, you know, f he, he had a, he, he created his own lexicon here, and for the entry for Rakia, for firmament, he put, um, you know, he has Rakia here, um, and he says, the firmament of heaven spread out like a hemisphere above the earth from the root raka um, like a splendid and pellucid sapphire uh, compare Daniel 12 3 um, to which the stars were supposed to be fixed and over which the Hebrews believed there was a heavenly ocean um, and then he talks here about the Septuagint translated Rakia as the stereoma and the Latin Vulgate here as firmamentum. And, you know, that comes down straight into English from the Latin Vulgate into firmament. So, you know, so this is uh, uh, an early uh, Hebrew um, lexicon here. Um, and, you know, Wilhelm Gesenius uh, hails from uh, from the German land, Ger you know, the G Germanic lands um, of uh, you know, of yesteryear, <laughs> so to speak. Okay, now coming here to, then to our next um, Hebrew lexicon um, known as Halot here. This just stands for um, Hebrew Aramaic Lexicon of the Old Testament. Um, and, and this is a five-volume set, and it's the standard modern lexicon uh, for, you know, for biblical studies. Um, and, and, and so the entry says this, By Rakia was understood the gigantic heavenly dome, which was the source of the light that brooded over the heavenly ocean, and of which the dome arched above the earthly globe. Um, and... Uh, and and anyhow, you can see here that that their their understanding here, um, rakia the beaten it's a it refers to a beaten metal plate or a bow, like as in a rainbow, uh, firmament firm vault of heaven, Septuagint stereoma vulgate firmamentum. We've seen this before, uh, and it will keep seeing it again, um, and then. Uh, and he sees, you know, you can look even here. He tells you to look at uh, Von Rod's, uh, I guess, contribution to the theological word book of the New Testament um, here in volume five. Um, and that you can see this in Othmar Kiel's Yahweh Visionen und um, Siegel Kunst. So this is like a um, the art that is from... Uh, 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 ancient seals, um, you know, like the the, the rolling, the, how you would roll uh, a seal over clay, clay stamps, and so there were there were artistic um, pieces made from uh, from you know that they made in the ancient world that where they stamped it onto clay, and it made some type of pictorial representation here. So he's just telling you to look in this volume here of Oath Mark Heels. Um But anyhow, um, I, what I'm what I, I what I want to say here is that all of these lexicons, you know, they they are referring to the firmament as something hard and and understood as a dome that was over the earth, holding back the heavenly waters. 
Now coming here then to uh, this slide, we'll look here at Manfred Gork uh, here. This is a, a, a quite accomplished German scholar. Um, and he, he was the one who was tasked with making the entry for the Rakia here in the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament. This is like, I don't know, 15 or, or 17 volumes long here. Um, and this happens to come out of volume 8 here. Uh, uh, this is where Rakia comes into play. Um, and so this is what uh, Manfred has to say. The late literary origin of all these occurrences is unmistakable. Furthermore, especially in the passages that use Raka in a cosmic context, a semantic orientation toward the noun Rakia is impossible to miss. Although this association does not mean that we should speak of uh, a denominative meaning of the verb in a secondary use of the stem. Uh, now, this may be referred to maybe some uh, conversation that he's having with uh, Gesenius. Um, this overview shows that the semic content of Raka, so he just, he's talking about any related word uh, to Raka or Rakia um, or, or some other adjective here um, should be looked for not in the action spatial extension but in its description. Here the aspects of technological compression and intensive stabilization are primary. So this is what he's saying because um, what they were doing in the ancient world uh, they would take um, remember the, the, the rebellion of Korah and, and with him, Dathan and Abiram, and then the 250 other people out of the tribes that, that were challenging the, the authority of Aaron to, to, you know, to have hegemony over the priesthood. Um, well, they were, that, was, that was being challenged by Korah and by Dathan and Abiram and these 250 uh, others in, in, with a censor test. And they took to them censors, and then Moses said, "Okay, well, you come, and we'll all meet here in the morning, and and you know, and Yahweh will will determine who he he's going to accept, whether whether I did this myself to make my brother the the you know the you know the the you know the the chief the head priest the the head rabbi of the nation, so to speak, um, um, or if Yahweh chose him." You know, um, and Moses said, "Look, I didn't do any of this of myself." So then Yahweh came down and He opened up the earth and it swallowed all these rebellious people, and they and they, and they went alive down into Sheol. And the 250 uh, people that were there for the censor test, well, they the earth didn't swallow them, but fire did, and then they were all they were all roasted. Um, uh, with fire, um, and and then God told Aaron to take up the the uh, the 250 censers because they were holy because they were used in this incense contest. So then they were beaten; they were all beaten out into plates, and that plate is called a rakia. So so um, so when we so when he says here, this overview shows that the semic content of raka should be looked for not in the action spatial extension but in its description here the aspects of technological compression and intensive stabilization are primary in p therefore rakia denotes a stable solid entity situated above the earth which protects the living world from an influx of of the waters of chaos the noun bears the connotation compact firm so that translation such as expanse miss the mark okay so um you know the, the, the you know you know thank god here for manfred gorg um you know he he has done god a service and um in in defining here that 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 when we look at the the, the term rakia 
you know, as a, the noun here, as some a firmament. We're looking for the technological aspects of compression and intensive stabilization. So something's being pounded out in order for a fitted for a specific task. You always, you know, if you're if you're making something out of metal, you're you obviously have a task for that metal to play, and so um, so you know in terms of the rakia here we're not talking literally about metal but uh, we are in terms of when it when it uses that context of metal such as the incense where they are told to pound out the incense sensors into into plates well into rakias okay they were they were metal plates okay so then the whole sky above us is is it's not the expanse it's it's you you can call it an expanse of a hammered worked out crystalline substance i mean if you want to if you want to keep your beloved word ex, you know um expanse it's it, it, it's it's that something was was beaten out hard or firm that was made then for a job so we saw in ezekiel that it's a crystalline substance so it is very hard, and um, it is um, spread out, built up um, upon the, I guess, the bottom surface of heaven, against the floor of heaven. Yeah, it's the floor of heaven um, from our perspective because the heavenly ocean is above it, and below it is the sun, moon, and stars. So it's not, you know, remember the folks that try to make you know that that the heavenly waters were the waters that were used in the flood i'm sorry they're above the firmament you know the sun moon and stars are put below the firmament okay um just look at day four here that's the reason for day two day two needed to be created so that there was a place for the sun moon and stars to habitate they, they had to have a, their own house their housing, that their housing, is in the firmament. Okay, I just want you to understand what's going on here. So, so we've looked here at at you know the three major, you know, three major, the the two top, hey, you know, Halot here and then TDOT here. I mean, this is the the premier, you know, theological dictionary of the Old Testament that exists here, and and we also have. We could have used Kleins. He's got an eight volume. He says the same thing. Um, we're not. We're not. We're not hiding anything. Um, this is all on display. So why? Why people? Why? Why modern conservative scholars don't follow this? They're, uh It's because it doesn't fit their cosmology. Okay, and and th and and that's actually really good because. We're following biblical cosmology. We're not. That's all we're concerned about. You know, modern cosmology um, is it, 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 the whole thing is in a state of flux. Um, so you guys, uh, so this this is the the Bible's testimony here. These are the heavyweights, um, and and Manfred. Uh, Gork here. We'll see him. That you know, he's also an Egyptologist, and and um, and and we'll see how Egypt viewed um, uh, the firmament in 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 just a little bit. Okay. Now coming here, we'll be looking at a few commentators um, and philologists here. Uh, um, and I wanted to present here John Walton, which is a uh, a real, real uh, slippery guy here, um, ultimately. Um, but one thing he does do is that uh, he correctly understands how we ought to understand what uh, the firmament was um, as it was used by the author and uh, in and its original and understood by, by um, the original audience. So we'll say here, begin here. Day two describes the setting up of the next function. 
focusing on the rakia. Despite the NIV's attempt to mitigate the meaning of this word through an ambiguous translation such as expanse and the attempt of others to make it scientifically precise through the translation atmosphere, Hugh Ross, Paul Seely has amply demonstrated that the rakia, structurally speaking, was perceived by the Israelite audience as a solid dome. As to the solidity of the firmament and the uh, historical context is that all peoples in all parts of the world, including the ancient Near East from the beginning of history until 200 AD and almost all peoples after that until modern times, believe that the sky, the firmament, was rock solid. Um, he's referring back there to the last time when we, when we looked at Paul Seeley. Um, this conclusion is not based on false etymologizing that extrapolates the meaning of the noun from its verb forms, which have to do with beating something out, but on the comparison of the lexical data from the Old Testament usage of the noun with the cultural context of the ancient Near East, the cultural context of the biblical author. Seely concludes with the statement that the defining that defining the firmament as atmosphere is a modernizing reinterpretation of the Bible, indeed a rewriting of the Bible. So he's absolutely right there. Um, but but as you know that John Walton here will will then he he will tell us how to understand it in, in its ancient you know historical context but then he said that well we don't believe in a in a rakia we don't believe in any hard thing above us and so we reject the whole biblical account uh, and he just says that God chose to reveal creation to the Hebrew Israelites through their own history and culture and did not want to update them to the truth. So he kept them in the dark and he only communicated to them through what they understood in their ancient history. Okay, and they're in, 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 you know, along with everyone else. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is such an abomination that he ultimately, what he ends up doing He's even making the problem worse here, okay? Um, and um, <clears throat> I, I, it's just, it's disgusting what, what John Walton has done. Um, you know, when you get the first page of the Bible totally wrong, what's it going to look like when you get to the end of the Bible? For John Walton, wow, he's already beginning to question whether they're demons or not based upon this same this same analogy here of of the firmament so he he oh my gosh this guy here is uh um he he he's a sad character okay now coming in here to um Klaus Vestermann here um uh, we will we'll go ahead and and we'll see now he's a commentator he wrote a commentary here on Genesis 1 to 11 uh, and and here he says the firmament the verb raka means to stamp with the feet uh, and he says look at Ezekiel uh, 6 11 and 25 you know clap your hands and stomp your feet that's the context here of, of Ezekiel 6 11 and to stamp down uh, we'll see this here. In the PL, it means to hammer out, to flatten. Rakia, then, is that which has been hammered out. Um, it is found in the same meaning in Psalm uh, 19.2. You know, he's following the Hebrew text. And in Job 37.18, as hard as molten mirror. Otto Prox uh, writes uh, that the the... This, this term here, I would say, I guess, um, marka here, is found in Phoenician for something which is hammered out, like a hammered out bowl. Um, 
Greek usage is this is the same as when Homer calls the heavens uh, Kalkaos or uh, Sideros, which just means bronze or iron here. Um, so that the ancient Greeks understood the the heavens as as metal, um, and um, <clears throat> so we'll continue on. In earlier times, the heavens were almost always regarded as solid. The description of the solid vault of the heavens is very widespread among primitive peoples. Uh, the Greek translates by stereoma, uh, Latin by firmamentum. The language has retained something of the ancient description, firmament, vault, dome of the heaven. Uh, the heavens are also described as a tent, okay, which has been spread out. Psalm 104.2, Isaiah 40.22, the heavens remain solid, uh, and it is difficult to reconcile the waters above the earth with such a description. The firmament, um, uh, the firmament and the clouds, Rakia, he, he just citing some other works here by other authors. The Old Testament refers several times to the waters above the solid vault of the heaven or to the heavenly ocean. And we have Psalm 104, 3, 13. Psalm 148 verse 4 which we saw last time and then 2 Kings 1, 2 and 19 and especially in the flood narrative Genesis 7, 11 following water pours down upon the earth through openings in the vault of heaven and we already mentioned that that's the only way that you can get a universal flood because you can't just take the water out of the air and dump it all on the ground wring it out and and you can flood the earth <laughs> you know by 15 uh, you know cubits above the highest mountain no you got to have water from an outside source okay and so some of the the vault of heaven was opened the floodgates beneath and then the rain so all of the water that had been in the in the um, atmosphere through transpiration when it you know Genesis 2 said the water would come up from the ground um, and, and it would create some type of water vapor canopy, something very different from what we've known because the, 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 ancient, uh, um, the ancient world w w was tropical. Um, and that We know that from the, the fossil record. Um, continue on. Water pours down upon the earth through openings in the vault of heaven. It's... Uh, it is a widespread image. Um, this heavenly sea is uh, originally heaven itself, which is described as a crystal clear mass of water suspended um, above the sea of glass, Revelation 4, 6. So Vesterman knows all this. Now, you know, to be honest here, I mean, he, you know, you know he he's a classic liberal he knows what the biblical text says he just says that it's you know that this you know the the ancient authors were wrong and the bible's wrong okay well um walton didn't want to say the bible was wrong he just said that god w chose not to um give the hebrews any updated revelation he just wanted to communicate with them through their own you know, time, their, their own history and culture. Um, so, so nothing new for them. Just keep them dumb. Keep, keep them in the dark. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, that, 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 that's the interpretation of, uh, Walton. I mean, I, you know, if you're going to pick between the, these two, I'd take Klaus Westermann any day. Um, I mean, I mean, to, you know, Walton's just making it worse. Um, but anyhow, but we just choose to basically, you know, we just believe the biblical cosmology. That that's the true cosmology. Okay, we're, uh, like I said, we're just parading through all of these uh, authors and philologists uh, and Hebrew scholars. Here, we'll continue on here with Gerald Wilson. The Hebrew term, uh, term "rakia" firmament reflects an ancient understanding of cosmology the formation and structure of the world that differs from our modern scientific view the rakia is a sort of upside down bowl that sat on the circular plate like earth 
to form a sealed environment in which human, animal, and plant life were secure. God created this arrangement at the beginning to bring order to the chaotic waters, which were limited by his decree uh, to prescribe boundaries um, above and below the earth. This celestial object, sun, moon, stars, were thought to be fixed in the Rakia and to move about there. So, so, so we have here um, the Rakia. We've got these windows here, and the the sun, moon, and stars are inside of the Rakia. The heavenly waters are up here, and then here's Earth down here. So this is basically, and then remember that uh, we saw that where the clasps of heaven came down into the waters of the Earth. So he's referring to this area here. Remember when we looked at... Uh, Perke uh, de Rabbi Eliezer there, chapter 3, that the clasps of heaven, the, 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 the heavens are curtains, right? They're spread out. And then the clasps take hold upon the waters uh, uh, of the ocean here. So, I mean, it's so cool, you guys. Um, I mean, the, just leave it to the rabbis to put it all together. So cool. Okay, now, um, coming here then to uh, Walter Zimmerle. Um, I, I believe this guy's a Swiss uh, theologian here. And and in the Hermania series of, uh, of, of time past here, um, for his, you know, um, you know when, when he talks here about the Rekia in Ezekiel, this is what he has to say. In uh, Rakia, there lies the idea of compactness, firmness, from the etymology of the root raka, to stamp, to beat hard, pl, to hammer flat, of metalwork. So this is exactly, um, you know, what what we saw back there uh, with Manfred Gorg there in TDOT saying the identical same thing here. It's Zimmerly here. And, um, you know, we're not dealing with, you know, um, with fantasies here. This is actually what the, what Rakia means. In all other Old Testament references, Genesis 1, Psalm 19, 2, uh, Psalm 150, uh, verse 1, Daniel 12, 3, Sirach uh, 43, 8, the noun is related to the vault of heaven. Thus here, the conception of the deity enthroned upon the splendor of the floor of heaven has entered into the description of the glory of Yahweh's appearing. Uh, Hakerak here, all right, signifies in Job 6, da-da-da-da-da, as ice, um, and in Job as hail, uh, and in Jeremiah as frost. The word, however, must also have signified crystal as the LXX translates crustalos, which is um, more suitable here as the, a description of the heavenly splendor. Exodus 24.10 supports the view that the reference to Yahweh being enthroned above the splendor of heaven represents a very ancient Israelite tradition. Ezekiel sees at once four creatures, the description of which recalls the seraphim of Isaiah 6, but which cannot be separated from the cherubim of Psalm 18, 11, which carry Yahweh. <clears throat> Over these living creatures, a fixed platform, i.e. a firmament, with the transparency of crystal is to be seen. E Exodus 10, or 24, 10 gives rise to the conjecture that um, here there is present the imagery of the Lord who is enthroned above the firmament. Above this platform, there is the throne upon which Yahweh sits in his glory. So um, we get the same message from Walter Zimmerle, um, and we continue. Okay, now coming here to uh, Walter Eichrodt, um uh, he is another German uh, theologian and um, uh, and scholar here, um, and he says the vault or firmament which they carry. So he's talking about here the uh, obviously the uh, uh, the cherubim here. Um, 
so we'll say the fault the vault or the firmament which the cherubim carry is the copy of that vault of heaven which the creator according to genesis 1 set up to separate the earthly from the heavenly waters and above which he is enthroned the four living creatures are thus shown to be representatives of the four corners of earth and therefore the world embracing sovereignty of him who is enthroned upon them uh, as is suggested by the fourfold faces and wings while they are related to the world the wor world ruler has no dwelling within the world but is enthroned in other worldly glory above the dome of heaven so remember we're saying that the uh, the firmament acts as, as the parocha the the uh, the veil that separates the holy from the holy of holies so that you know so we have the you know you have the outside court you have the inside of the holy place where the priests go and then the holy of holies is where god dwells above the cherubim and, and you know um and, and so here the, the 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 heavens are being built here that well well the third heaven houses god which is above the firmament just as in ezekiel's vision above the firmament you know that was seen as crystal is a throne of god and you know below it is the you know the the cherubim um okay uh, so this is what's going on here this is what's being described and walter eichrode understands this the heavenly brightness is represented by crystal uh, uh you know and it says see the crystal sea of revelation 4 6 uh, and blue sapphire just as in um, Exodus 24:10, the pavement under the feet of the God of Heaven already appears to be light blue and gleaming like sapphire. Boom! There you go. We mentioned this all last time together. Walter Eichrott understood this um, a long time ago. So, folks, we just continued the parade, and this is what's going on. I'm not making up you know uh fables or we're not funny you know you know you know following uh cunningly devised fables we're we're, we're following the biblical okay so we're going to come to a jewish scholar here uh nahum sarna uh so he's speaking here in his genesis commentary on 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 one six here and expands the hebrew noun rakia is unparalleled in cognate languages the verbal form is often used for hammering out metal or flattening out earth which suggests the basic meaning of extending it is unclear whether the vault of heaven was here viewed as a gigantic sheet of metal or as a solid layer of congealed ice the latter interpretation might be inferred from ezekiel 122 which is how josephus understood it as well no josephus understood it as as crustalos but he is right that you know that that Karak, um here um could uh um could be ice um so so either as as ice or as uh, uh crystal uh, and we saw that josephus definitely followed it as as crystal we saw that was our first slide i think Okay, so we come here to John Goldingay, one of my old professors there at Fuller Seminary. Uh, the dome is the sky, uh, which has the appearance of a solid vault when one looks up from the earth. It will hold back the upper water except when God uh, allows it to come through. It will thus make a distinction between the two bodies of water. Here God makes the dome rather than simply summoning it into existence, whereas Josephus sees God as making rain and dew possible. Genesis sees God as stopping water from being overwhelming. The creation of the firmament uh, with its comprehensive uh, opposition of form to formlessness and the possibility of life to the ne necessity of death aims at a peaceful and meaningful existence of the creature before its creator. Once again, we should not be wooden in interpreting the Genesis poetry as it portrays the dome. The Israelites had noticed that the rain came from clouds, da 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 da, and once again, Genesis' account of the dome contrasts with the account 
um, in uh, the Enuma Elish when on high where Marduk makes the dome by splitting Tiamat like a shellfish using the top half as the dome and setting guards to make sure that Tiamat's water does not escape. Um, so says uh, Golden Gate. Okay, then uh, we're coming here then to a, uh, a Jewish scholar, um, I believe of Italian descent, um, and he says, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, in, in the midst of the waters of the deep, which constituted the upper stratum of the original um, amorphous matter, there was to be formed a firmament, rakia. The root of the word is the same as that of uh, vayirakku. Um, uh, and they did hammer out. And in Exodus, uh, what is that, 39.3, and they did hammer out gold leaf. The term signifies a kind of horizontal area extending through the very heart of the mass of the water and cleaving it in two layers, one above the other, the upper and lower layers of water. From this, uh, we may infer that immediately after its formation, the firmament occupied uh, of its own accord the place appointed for it by the will of God, which is the side of the heavens as we know it. Thus, as soon as the firmament was established in the midst of the layer of water, it began to rise in the middle, arching like a vault, and in the course of its upward extension, it lifted at the same time the upper waters resting on top of it. This marked a considerable advance in the marshalling of the components of the universe. Um, above now stands the vault of heaven surmounted by the upper waters. Beneath stretches the expanse of the lower waters, that is, the waters of the vast sea, which still cover all uh, the heavy solid matter below. The universe is beginning to take shape. Okay, so now we make full circle and we come back to Paul Seeley where we began last week. Uh, these two similarities between firmament in Ezekiel and the firmament in Genesis could hardly be coincidental. The firmament in Ezekiel 1 must be related to the firmament in Genesis 1. And the number of commentators have made, uh, and a number of commentators have made that identification. And I just got done showing you that. Icro, for example, calls the firmament of in Ezekiel a copy of that vault of heaven. The New Testament confirms the virtual identity of the firmament in Ezekiel and the firmament in Genesis by combining them into one image. And we have Revelation 4, 6. And then also the, this, this one here in Revelation you know, 15.2, where they sing the song of Moses and, and of Christ, that, um, you know, the, the uh, great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, um, you know, for, for thou art the king of saints and all that. That whole, that whole song, they're singing on top of the dome here. Okay, in the in the heavenly waters, uh, they stand upon the sea of glass, and they're singing the song of uh, of Moses and Christ here. Great and marvelous are they works. So they're 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 singing Kevin Prosh's song here. I mean, the next time you listen to Kevin Prosh's song, uh, um, King of Saints, uh, go check that out on YouTube. King of Saints. Kevin Prosh, and then imagine that that you know, then read Revelation fifteen two, and then uh, man, just just uh, soak it in. Um, we ought uh, then on both biblical and hermeneutical grounds to interpret the nature of the rakia in Genesis one by the clear definition of rakia, which we have in Ezekiel one, and all the more so. Uh, since the language of Genesis 1 su suggests solidity in the first place and no usage of rakia anywhere states or even implies that it was not a solid object. This latter point bears repeating. There is not a single piece of evidence in the Old Testament to support the conservative. I love that. I mean, since I'm a conservative, but, 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 but he's egging us on uh, that that most of us conservatives here uh, trash his this interpretation. Uh, 
but he says, uh, let's read this again. The latter point bears repeating. There's not a single piece of evidence in the Old Testament to support the conservative belief that the Rekia was not solid. Oh my gosh, that's what a great quote. Uh, the historical meaning of Rekia, so far from uh, being overthrown by the grammatical evidence, is confirmed by it. The historical gr grammatical meaning of Rekia in uh, Genesis 1, 6, 8, is very clear, literally solid firmament. It is to the credit of E.J. Young, um, so now he's kind of, you know, picking up some of the reformed ideas, you know, the, the of the reformers, the, the Calvinists here. It, it is to the credit of E.J. Young that although believing in biblical inerrancy um, as much as any other conservative, so we stand with E.J. Young, uh, he, he alone did not alter or rationalize the historical grammatical meaning of Rekia. So good for E.J. Young, that's where we stand. Uh, in his studies in Genesis 1, he defined Rekia uh, as that which is hammered, beaten out, and noted that the LXX stereoma and Vulgate uh, firmamentum are satisfactory renderings. Amen. Okay, and um, I think that uh, it's just running on a little bit too long here. We're going to end it here uh, for today. This has been Biblical Theology, Exegesis, and Hermeneutics, where meaning is always context-driven. Please like, share, subscribe, and comment. And what we're going to do, we will kind of wrap it up on the next slide. Um, and, and we basically need to look at, um, you know, okay, so we have drawn certain conclusions here um, concerning, you know, um, you know, what all of the the lexicons have said and 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 what the commentators have said here um and you know concerning biblical cosmology um so the next slide will will deal with um uh we'll, we'll just finish out we'll finish out our series you know um uh, uh, on the firmament in our next slide, but it's just getting to be a little bit too, too long. But I just wanted to parade before you today that you know that we're not uh, following cunningly devised fables. Where that you know this is this is actually the what it what what the what Moses intended his original audience to understand when. When, when Genesis, you know, uh, on the second day, talking about the firmament, um, you know, God, uh, you know, gave us the book of Ezekiel to make sure we understood um, later on, uh, you know, in posterity, and then how Revelation took Genesis 1 and Ezekiel, combined it together, you know, um, and then showed them, you know, showed, brought up John to, on top of the dome. Uh, and he was brought up to heaven, um, and uh, and he saw the sea of glass, and uh, upon the sea of glass was the throne, and Yahweh was sitting upon it, and uh, and an emerald rainbow about him, just just basically almost identical to what Ezekiel saw. He saw above the heads of the cherubim a firmament, you know, like unto unto uh, unto crystal. Um, and the throne of Yah, uh, the throne of Yahweh, and and a rainbow about him, and he he fell down as if dead. So um, so this is you know th this is basically this is this is terra firma, um, and uh, and there's absolutely no reason to be ashamed of it.